Good morning. Okay, so my name is Chris Follows. Um, my digital electrices are just being tested right now. I'm in front of a PC. Um, that, that one, yeah. Is there a presenter view? Can anyone slideshow presenter view? From beginning. Yeah. Oh, no, there's not a presenter view. Anyway, there's, there's me panicking on stage, um, doing digital stuff. And I should know better. Clearly don't. Um, so I'm introducing uh, two projects, um, and I'll touch on Alto as well. Um, I'm project manager of the Dial project, which is uh, digital integration into arts learning, which is a digital literacies uh, program that JISC are running. And I'm also the initiator of Process Arts, which was uh, a sort of grassroots built um, online sharing environment for the University of the Arts London that started off, um, which was started around 2008. Nice image there. I think that's going to be a common theme. <laughs> I don't know why, but you can see the attribution at the bottom. That's quite important where I've got that image from. Uh, and uh, that's kind of what I'm going to be touching on today. Okay, so I'll, I won't talk about this, this, this whole graphic here, but just to, just to show where Process Arts fits in today, um, down there in the bottom right-hand corner, this is the new VLE uh, that's been implemented. Uh, we've got the Moodle with all its new tools. We've got myblog.arts and workflow. And we've got Filestore. So Filestore was the, another GIST project which was uh, introduced the um, open education resources to UAL and put um, a lot of the groundwork for the policies of open educational resources and open educational practice and uh, that came under the umbrella of uh, ALTO. So when you see the, the term ALTO, Arts Learning Teaching Online, that's essentially what the file store was, which is uh, essentially a, a repository uh, for all content, uh, learning and teaching content. So slightly different from the research. Process Arts was a bit more of an informal space for, for sharing um, <coughs> sharing practice uh, across the uh, colleges, um, learning and teaching practice, but also uh, with the outside world. So it was like opening a platform up to uh, invite others from across the world to join, uh, join in with uh, developing uh, open educational practice. Um, so some of the key, key elements of that were, was to obviously to include the Creative Commons licence on, on all uh, content that's produced, so you have a choice of whether you um, choose to share that content or not. Uh, so some of the key aspects were that it's a totally open resource um, for creating OERs, and it was about supporting uh, each other in that, in that process, you know, in, in understanding what OERs are and open educational practices. Uh, it was important that it was open to everyone. Uh, that was quite a new thing to the university, uh, really quite different. Um, and sort of encouraging... And supporting um, experimentation, which I think is, is quite important, which, which we, um, <coughs> there's quite, kind of very few spaces online for us to do that unless we go out into the outside world, into the commercial world, uh, which is where everyone seems to be going. <coughs> so uh, it's also introducing this new informal space, I think, which is quite important because we've got a lot of formal learning and teaching spaces. Uh, the informal space at the moment is out in social media land, um, uh, commercial land. And in a way, Process Arts was developed to try and bridge that gap. Um, and that was the important thing about this being a sort of non-commercial space uh, that was uh, sector-driven and owned, not owned by some corporate <coughs> outsider. So, and it's also a new space that uh, straddles both the, in, the, the formal learning and the some inf informal learning. Um, experimental, I said that again, so that's obviously clearly very important. Um, uh, for the practitioners and the supporting of grassroots activity and I think this is one of the key elements of process arts it's almost like a starting ground so if you've got a project and you want to collaborate with a, a US university for instance uh, where do you go? at the moment you have to go off and set up a Ning site and pay $40 a, a month so this is a space now at UAL where people can go in and start to, to develop uh, collaborations we're going to be talking about that with Jess uh, very soon um, and also, it's about defining this new language, this new edgy social language, this, this, this language that's in between the, in, in, the internal education 
<coughs> the way we collaborate internally online, but also how we collaborate so, uh, within the sort of outside social spaces. Okay, so some of these these are some of the groups that are um, currently have been developed on process arts, and Jess will talk about one of those groups in, in a moment. Um, so. Uh, the bottom left-hand corner, you can see, or right-hand corner to you, is a collaboration between C, Dial, Sultad, Learn IT. Again, how, how can that happen? So this is a space for that to happen. Uh, but we're also bringing industry within that as well. Um, and then we've got Drawing Out, top right-hand corner, uh, which was, again, a conference, that for Australian conference, but had uh, people from all over the world, and they all uploaded their resources themselves. So you've got Australian, American universities uploading their resources from that conference. Okay, so the transition for UAL and us into open practice is quite a big one. Um, and this is, uh, I nicked this graphic, but I've, I've reworked it, and you can see my attribution at the bottom. This is knowledge that I've adapted this. Um, and this is where we're at at the moment. So the top of this iceberg is is what Process Arts is doing. It's, it's making uh, a sort of visible open practice so people are observing uh, what open practice is, uh, what goes on, how we share stuff, um, the sort of culture that comes with that. Where we're at at the moment is all this hidden black market uh, learning and teaching where we all go on Wikipedia and we don't acknowledge that we're going there. Uh, we all nick images off the internet and we don't uh, attribute them or have any um, <coughs> understanding or responsibility for our our um, use of content online. So, in a way, the, the, this is why a space like Process Arts is quite important because it, it, it provides this, this space for these cultures to develop, like digital citizenship um, and uh, mentorship, uh, acknowledgement, which is really important. So, when you do something online, you uh, get some sort of acknowledgement that, okay, that was a good practice or that wasn't, uh, try it this way. So this is the kind of feedback that you get back. Um, it's a kind of learning journey uh, for some, um, where you, you kind of, it's okay to do it wrong, but then you've got someone that can hold your hand that can take you, take you through this process. I'll quickly scan through this because I've only got 10 minutes. So this is the sort of journey into open practice. I've put myself as an OEP, Open Education Practice Resident. My residence, where I live, is Process Arts. That's where I practice, and hopefully others will practice there as well. Uh, a lot of people were in this lodger state where they just try different spaces and see what, what suits them, uh, and they move from space to space. The OEP uh, unaware or aware are, are the people that know it's there and are just absorbing and, and observing different spaces. And then we've got a lot of people, majority of people are totally unaware. So the motiv uh, motivation to participate, which is our biggest challenge, uh, how do we do that? This is why I could talk about DIAL now. So the digital integration to arts learning um, is the GIST project, like we said, we're in the second year. And part of this project was to improve graduate employability. Uh, so basically how digital is impacting on, on, on employability and how it's integrated into the curriculum. Um, but also uh, confidence and the capability in the adoption of, of uh, using the, um, digitally enhanced learning and teaching. And I think that's one of our biggest challenges. So on the very sort of low level of this, you get this sort of remark, which is fantastic. And if pe more people could actually say this, I think we'd all move a lot faster. And I think it takes quite a brave person to, to stand up and say that. Luckily, when they talking about me, they were talking about digital. <laughs> when I first did the first bit of... But, like I say, you know, I'm, I'm a physical wreck. When I, yesterday, I tried to print some images off the PC at work, and I, uh, it was an epic fail. So, <clears throat> you can be uh, also quite good at digital, but have serious uh, concerns about it. So, what we're doing at uh, Dial is this uh, self-identified groups, and this is where Jess is now going to uh, talk about the group that, that uh, she's been running uh, with the library services. Uh, which allows this time to develop, it's come from grassroots, it's problem-based or interest-based, and it provides these open content communities as well. Um, and this is some of, the, some of the stuff that's surfacing from early evaluation, and this is all going again back to this. this these keywords are coming up, which is um, anxieties. Uh, and, <coughs> yeah, there's, there's this general anxiety and fear of, of digital, <laughs> which we need to address. 
well. Leave that there and uh, pass over to Jess. It's my turn to fumble with technology. <laughs> uh, is it that one? Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Hi. Okay. So uh, when the Dial project got off the ground in the university, um, we thought it was an excellent opportunity. Oh, sorry. We thought it was an excellent opportunity for library services to get involved. So we became one of these self-identifying groups um, working um, with the Dial project. And David and I got in touch with Chris and we decided that our group would be on digital information literacy. That was very appropriate for us as a, as a community. And this, this gave us a bit of opportunity and space to look at our own skills and development. We know that there's a lot of very creative early adopters in the department, but there are also people who, who may want to develop their skills or know more about digital tools and digital literacy. So what do we really mean by digital information literacy? There's an enormous uh, amount of literature about this, but um, there's a very simple definition of digital literacy, which I find quite useful, which is the GISC one, which is those capabilities which fit an individual for living, learning and working in a digital society. So that's quite nice and simple. So in terms of digital information literacy... I think we're all very familiar with information literacy as an idea, as librarians. Um, it's all to do with searching for information, managing information, sharing information. So really, digital information literacy is just doing that with digital tools or in a digital landscape. So that's the area that we're focusing on in our um, project. We started off looking at um, 23 Things programmes, and I don't know whether many of you have come across these. I know that somebody, Siobhan, is actually, is actually doing one of these. Basically, these are online learning programmes. They started off in public libraries and then got adopted um, in the HE sector. And typically, what you do is it lasts several weeks. Each week, you do two or three things, hence 23 Things. Uh, and typically, you start off a blog, uh, you join Twitter, you, you have an explanation how to do these things, you start doing them. There's usually um, a supportive community and usually um, mentors to, to help you uh, go through this process. So we reflected on this for a while and asked people what they thought about it. And so there were elements of this that we really liked, but then we decided that really we need to know a lot more about your <coughs> views and your ideas before we went any further. And we developed the idea of a more, possibly a more flexible tool, Things Unlimited. And as you can see, this really is kind of quite literally blue skies, blue skies thinking. So we were thinking maybe we could develop an online tool, but instead of being a program that you go through, it could have various different functions. So, for example, it could be a place where you go for explanation and examples of good practice, um, including all the university resources that we're beginning to discover and tap into and use, like elements of process arts. It could be a resource bank that you use when you're delivering information literacy sessions. It could be a place to go to discuss the adoption of new tools with colleagues and how we could use them in our practice. Or it could be a place that you go to practice and develop your own professional practice and again possibly with mentoring from early adopters within the department or other colleagues. So we're just exploring what this online resource might be. But as I said, we need to know a lot more about your, your views um, because what we really want is for this to be absolutely relevant. Um, otherwise, you know, we, we don't want to head off in the wrong direction. So we need to know more about what you really want because we know that we're all um, time poor. So uh, at lunch and tea in the breaks, we've employed um, somebody from Arts Temps who's got a very short um, five-minute survey who will be asking you some questions about your views and ideas in this area and it would be really helpful um, if you could fill that survey in. Thank you very much.